Tango 1 is stopped. We are at Papa Control. 10 4, Tango 1. You have control. Tango 1 copy. Stand by. Stand by. Integrity, passion, resilience. That's what this place was built on. That's what our community is founded on. Don't act like the example, just be the example. This is the home of the greatest fitness community in the world. We're trying to create strong, able bodies, resilient to injury with a gas tank to get shit done. If there's one thing from this podcast, it's about taking immediate action, find the problem, fix the problem. This is your opportunity. It's either a hell yes or a fuck no. It's that simple. You're ruining that one podcast. Now is the time to take action. Now's the time to do more and be more. So, uh, welcome to the Tango One Podcast. I'm Tony Smith, retired cop and tag team leader, currently the founder of the Garage Gym, Tango One Solutions, joined by my co-host Casey Wright. Our mission is to challenge you and guide you to create immediate action plans against your problems and weaknesses. Simply put, we want you to do more and be more. Today's episode is sponsored by Stephen Kidd, financial advisor. Does your financial advisor take the time to really listen to you? Is your financial strategy personalized for you and your family? Will your financial advisor be there as your life and financial situation change? When you work with Stephen Kidd, your local Edward Jones financial advisor, he focuses on what's important to you. You'll work together and use an established process to create a personalized financial strategy that is backed by the advice, tools, and resources to help you reach your goals. And you'll partner to help your strategy stay on track. Contact Stephen Kidd today at 519-734-8599. That's 519-734-8599. Edward Jones, member, Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Stephen Kidd's wife, Steph, hit her 500th class, I think, uh, today or yesterday, which is pretty sweet for her. And uh, I think Steve just celebrated his birthday, so big uh, big ups to them. Anyway, speaking of FYF, so today was a big FYF for us. We just celebrated our three-year anniversary here at the Garage Gym in Kingsville. So we actually record here from Amherstburg, where we've been open five, six years. But Kingsville was their third year, almost to the day. And uh, we had a big FYF there today. It was a ton of fun. So thank you for everybody who came out, celebrated, and had a little uh, coffee or an espresso with a little shot in it. It's awesome. <laughs> That's big. First in your read-on, I can tell you're hitting your weekly or daily challenge of 10 pages of a book. Uh, yeah, yeah. That we got the smoothest, <laughs> smoothest read. In it was by far my book. smoothest read. <laughs> yeah, I have been reading my 10 pages of a book. I'm reading a book about Caesar right now. Uh, this is insane, man. That guy, he like, what a crazy story. I'm only like fucking 30 pages in cause I'm on the third day of the challenge. But, uh, what'd you pick up? Uh, I'm finishing a book into the fire by Dakota Meyer. It's all about this like big deployment in Afghanistan and they get caught up in the conjugal Valley. And it's just like, it's pretty gruesome <laughs> story of some heavy shit, but it was like interesting. And he ends up getting a medal of, medal of honor through the end of it for all he did. He ran in back and forth into this valley that they're just constantly getting shot at for like six hours to find his team. And it's just a wild story. So I'm I think chapter left in the book. So it's been, it's been good, but like you're actually reading this physically, not an yeah. author. Yeah. No, I'm listening, I'm listening to another book, but this one I'm physically, physically yeah, I've always reading. got one of each going. Yeah. So, yeah. But back to the FYF. So yeah, yeah. Third year anniversary. FYF is Fuck You Friday. Fuck You Friday. So one of the Garage things, Gym Classic. My first workout ever at the gym when I was going through my interview process for a trainer here, that was the first workout I did. Hmm. I showed up in the morning. For me, it was like, I think at like 7 a.m. for an interview with you to sit down before. It might even be like 8 o'clock. But Formal time, interview with me? Yeah, but at the time, it felt like early which is hilarious when we got up at 4 30 today um but my first introduction to the gym was an fyf and it was a row relay at the time and i instantly understood why you call it that so where did this idea sprout from what is fyf how did this all get going so back like 2004 ish uh my buddy there bobby maximus who was with Jim Jones and he, was, he used to be a cop and that's how, you know, this whole training thing started. You guys have all heard that story. So Bobby Maximus, you know, is working for a company, Jim Jones, and they start doing this fuck you Friday thing. And for them, it was like, Jim Jones is like a real secret. Like back then they didn't advertise any, you have a sign on the wall, like, and you couldn't get a hold of them. It was near impossible. So it was like by, like, you couldn't just look them up and like, be like, Hey, I'm dropping in. There's like no chance. So they started doing this FYF, which was like a buy, invitation only workout so when danny first sent me up there as that surprise birthday party in 2004 2005 maybe 2006 something like that um i head up and i get my first taste of fyf 
and my first ever Airdyne ride, which was like insane because now everybody seems to have them, but it was wild. And the hardest workout I've ever at that point in my life that I'd ever completed. And then I kind of brought that home with me and we started doing them with the uh, tag team. And it, you know what, FYF really, and then, you know, came to the garage gym. And even when I was at the garage gym in my house, it was still only by invite. And it was some of like the biggest and toughest uh, motherfuckers, I like to say, that I knew. And it, it had for our team, it had nothing to do with programming or really fitness even. It was like just a day. It was Friday, every Friday in the gym at the police station, we would do FYF together. And it was just like, we, it, it brought competition. It brought this form of stress that you can only like, you know, really. It's like a sporting event. Yeah, but also like kind of like pushed you so far out of your comfort zone where you kind of felt that same feeling we felt on calls. And it was like, it just for us became this like bond. And then when we started doing it at my house in the gym, you know, I started inviting the, you know a few members here and there. And then everybody kind of wanted to do it. And at first I was real reluctant. I was like very protective of that day. But then I saw like, I'm like seeing like, you know, house moms and like people just like kill these days and absolutely love doing it. So it's like stuck here and it's been a tradition ever since. And it's like probably our busiest day. And definitely yeah. it's the day that the trainers are like, you're not training. If yeah. we always say big boy you, rules on you FYF in, day, you jump, you jump in. in and on that one. But it's good because like you see it, especially after the workout, it is usually usually the harder workout of the week. And like you said, now there's probably a little more strategy behind programming it, but it's mostly just like, this is what we're doing. It's some ridiculous number or some relay or whatever. And it's just like balls to the wall for the next 40 minutes or 50 minutes. And then after you see everybody just like gassed and done, but it's the best community in the room. And then with that, especially at nighttime, that's when you, before everything going on, obviously it's a little different now. But before COVID and everything, that's when everyone sits at the gym for that extra hour and bonds, like behind closed doors, has a beer and like, yeah, and man, but sits there. And that's where you start to build the relationships. And I think that is a huge aspect of the community at the gym is like, you go do a good workout somewhere in this big box gym, you look around and celebrate with yourself or the workout partner you have. Whereas here, now you're looking around the room at 20 different people who all just went through the same you know, 40 minute battle with you and then you're sitting there and you can shoot the shit and it's a great way to meet people. And it just, I think it just builds into that whole community aspect of things. Yeah. Everybody used to hang out and have a beer. I mean, I think even two weeks ago, we hung out in the side yard, a bunch of us, right. With, uh, Andrea and Liz and uh, Val and Steve is a big group of us out there. It was, it was fun to just sit around and like, it's like, you just want to battle together a little bit, yeah. you know, you know I mean, something when, when people are coming, <laughs> who did it in the morning come after yeah it's done at yeah the that end was emily right beer. yeah cheeks was sitting outside <laughs> waiting for us yeah just to, to kind of cheer people on it yeah it, it's just become this own little entity here and like like you said uh post pre-covid it was like you know there was relays like fifteen thousand meter ski relay with a bunch of like you know per, uh, burpees and pull-ups and push-ups and stuff in between on your rest it's, it's just a very fun way to get everybody together and today we actually did our first post COVID uh, relay and we did it relay friendly or COVID friendly. We all had our own uh, stations, but essentially we were still working together to accumulate a number and get it done. A lot of times we do things we like to call them. Uh, last week's wasn't very popular, a single movement mind fuck. So, you know what? Sometimes when you come into FYF, it's about team building and some days it's just about getting in your own head and doing one movement for a full hour. You know, we've done burpees for a whole hour and that's one of like our favorite stories is there's one of our favorite guys, uh, Hammy, James Olette, and uh, he joined this gym years ago and he brought his uh, now husband, but he brought his boyfriend in and said, hey, don't worry, it's not that bad. It's not like we're going to do burpees for an hour or anything. And that was actually randomly, that was like the workout for that day. It was like burpees every minute on the minute for like an hour. And uh, that was his introduction. I could not, you had a first day of FYF, but I can't imagine that being the, the next no, day of anybody's I don't know first if I day. I stuck around if it was my first workout with, uh, yeah. with just so, burpees for that time. Kudos to Everett for doing that one. That's a cool kind of mental aspect, though, I think, to the gym is like one, building that, not so much anxiety, but getting people thinking about that day. And I think it builds like the energy of the room and people like, Especially now there's there's different sides to it, but you used to, you know, you wait, you don't write on the board till everybody's in the class. So people aren't looking ahead or, you know, it's it's kind of forbidden to message your friends for the later workout. It's supposed to be a bit of a secret. So it just kind of 
generates this like fun kind of atmosphere with things and yeah they're usually not uh the most fun you know and it's cool it's kind of like anybody who kind of grew through that bobby maximus or jim jones era like i know there's byron out in houston does it and there's you know gyms in indiana and chicago there's gyms like basically all over the world that are still doing this fyf whether those people have stayed with jim jones or not it's kind of this nucleus of people that it's kind of that connection i have like if i went you know traveled to california I would probably hit up a gym there or travel to New York to, to see Joe and Dan. Hey, can I come to FYF? It's just like a thing. And it's like, you know, you get welcomed in. It's kind of a real cool thing, man, that we have going on here. And I love when people get to experience it. I also love when the first like, you know, quiet, meek person comes in here as a, as a new like recruit type member. And they're like, what does FYF mean? And you're like, fuck you Friday. And you or like little Nikki's like, fuck you Friday. <laughs> right. And like people are just like, think it's like, they're like, Oh my God, what is this place? And the, the music is blaring. So I love it. I think it sets us apart from other people. So we can FYF. I'm like so dry mouth. I'm going to grab this water. <laughs> so today's FYF. No, I'm good right now. I have tequila. <laughs> you got tequila too. All right, today's FYF was like brutal. Like one of the closest to puking in a while. Really? Well, I was up there. We were on the air bikes. And then within a minute of the class being over, I told you earlier, really, we got a call. So as soon as the, the workout's done, saying goodbye to everyone, run down the street to the hall, and we were gone for like an hour as a false alarm. But I was just like, this is insane. I got in the truck, and I was already sweating. And it was just... That's how the insane. world works. I always just say when I've had like a, we call it, we don't swear that. We swear a lot, I guess. MFLD, so motherfucking leg day. Every time that we do like legs heavy is when I would get like into a foot chase at night or have to climb up, you know, a uh, hundred, you know, hundred stairs or whatever, 10 flights of stairs to, to hit a door. It just seems to be Murphy's law. Real funny story is uh, Danny once wrote a warrant. So when she was in the drug squad, she wrote a warrant and it was like for, I want to say 24th floor. And like, we don't take the elevator for the most part. We, uh, we went through this back stairwell and we had to hump it up 24 floors. And I remember carrying the Ram, like we were taking turns, carrying this little Ram, you got your machine gun and it was leg day. And I was probably hung over because I was always hung over back in those days. And we get up to this door and we end up blasting the door off and they, they had barricaded it with a couch and we were knuckleheads in those days. Like we just kept hitting it, hitting it, hitting it until the door, the top half of the door broke off mm -hmm. and we climbed up and over the couch of this place. And it ends up that there was like nothing inside. And I remember being so like mad because we were like, we walked up all these stairs and basically for nothing. And I remember her coming up and be like, ah, that was way before we were dating, but she was cute. So I, I got over it. <laughs> but anyways, uh, and that's when you fell in love. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so like, I don't know we're like past episode 20 something, like we're, we're 23, 24. Now. It's been pretty incredible. We've had such a crazy list of guests. Um, I don't know. What do you think so far was your favorite episode? It's like hard to be uh, not biased here, right? And you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But like, what was the most one of the most fun? Yours? Mine was the best. Um, um, no, there's been, uh, I don't know. I, I can't really pinpoint one specifically. I think just like there's probably different segments to each one. Like one, Jimmy Max always great to have on here. He's, he's a blast because he just like, he's just so curious and he has so much knowledge. So he's always fun to listen to. Brings the energy. Um, Corey was obviously a good one. Great to sit down with him. Um, and it was just kind of, there's little segments of each person. Like, yeah, that's to it for to me too. People. So even like the muscle doc um, a few weeks ago is like being able to sit in a room with him and whether we're, when we were recording and before and after just hearing like his knowledge and his experiences is just fun to, to hear about. So I think that's what's one of the coolest parts is just listening to people, even members of ours, like Noel Fleming, who, never knew like you talk to a little bit about people's social life and, and personal life when you're in the gym and coaching but you don't get so far in depth or see necessarily everyone's success outside and in their own field so it was kind of like just great to hear different people's story it, yeah i cool. i gotta agree with you 100 percent. like i feel like snippets of every episode have been like so like i feel like every episode has been great i'm biased of course but like snippets have been like very like awesome to me and like also, another thing, like you said, with Noah and like our own members and people here and just all of this network of people. And I'm grateful for every person that's come on here is that like, I guess I didn't totally appreciate the kind of networking connections that I do have. And it's been so like wonderful to kind of like put those people on display from the other gym owners to, you know, 
uh, the muscle doc, like you said, and and Irene, who I had never spoke to, and we 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 spoke about like the Black Lives Matter thing. We got into that. We've gotten into it with the chief of police. It's just been wild, man, and it's been so awesome. One of my favorite episodes for sure, though, has got to be those Iron Donkeys. Those guys <laughs> sit so close to my heart. Those uh, you know, those four guys, but the three of them that came on here and just you know poured their hearts out and told their inspiring story of how they all changed their lives. And I think, in a nutshell, like that's just kind of what. The whole reason for leaving the police department, the whole reason for, you know, starting this podcast, the garage gym, everything has been for that to make a difference to people. So it's just been awesome. And, and every time I get like a message, got messages today from, you know, Jeff McGee, one of our big, uh, our big uh, promoters uh, to, out, talking yeah. about the episode. And yeah, McGee. So I appreciate every single one of you who message us, who comments, who likes us, who follows us. So thanks very much. So this episode, we actually want to get into some questions. Some viewers sent us some questions, viewers or listeners, because it is available on all platforms. Which one are you listening to? So please subscribe on there. We don't really ask for that often, but I think we should more so we can start to climb this thing up a little bit. Definitely. So we do have some submissions from some things. And I think just a segue from what you just talked about and surrounding yourself with people, um, we'll start with this question. And then what she writes is there's so much negativity out there right now. You have always preached about surrounding yourself with like-minded people to block out the negativity. I try to do this, but I can't necessarily choose the people I work with, and I can't avoid family members that try to pull me into the spiritual, the spiral of bitching and complaining. I don't know if I should just set her first name on this one. <laughs> um, how do you avoid being sucked into negative conversations, especially when it's with the people you spend time with day in and day out? Yeah, so I'm assuming that she knew we were going to use her name, but <laughs> so if, we might beep it out. Yeah, we might beep it out, so we won't use it again. <laughs> I'm going to check on that first. So anyways, uh, yeah, so there is so much negativity out there. And I can tell you that the police department was one of the most um, could be was not always, but could be one of the most negative, you know, um, poisonous places that you could be around because a lot of people are very disgruntled there a lot of overworked people a lot of people see a lot of terrible things and for me but there's also so many great people and that's it right there in a nutshell is like none of my energy goes towards the negative people other than to like and i've talked about this in lots of podcasts and and, and you know through my coaching groups that i that i handle and to the guys that i handle is that uh I have a list on my wall and it's a, I will not list. So I have like 10 things written down. I will not say no to my boys if they want to read with me. I will not do this. I will not check my phone during workouts. I will not do this. And one of those things is I will not respond to a negative with a negative. And what I mean by that is if somebody bitches to me about the weather, like, Hey, it's, Oh, it's so shitty outside today. My response is like, yeah, but it's a great day for us to do this. You know, and that's like a real blanket response. But like, it's just turning that when somebody brings a negative, you bring it right back with a positive. Mm -hmm. And if they say another negative, you bring another positive. And then all of a sudden people either realize that this is not the guy to talk to about my negativity. Yeah. Or like they start to actually kind of see it. the light, the, 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 the a, gratitude type a, thing, yeah, like so Mackenzie said. Or, say the gratitude idea of things. And I think that's a big part too with working with people, especially people you don't get along with per se is like one thing is like you could always find something that you have in common. Like that's one thing I know I've struggled with in the past with certain people is you're just like, for whatever reason, we don't get along, but we work together. It's like if you keep kind of picking away and like overwhelm them with happiness sometimes and like with questions, eventually there's going to be something that might be fantasy football. It might be, you know, your kids, there might be something that that's the one thing you have in common, play off that. And then you'll start to find out a lot more about people like so it's tough to not make you know those judgment calls of people sometimes right off the bat and then as you get through layers you start to realize like you do you maybe have a lot more in common than you think with people and on Tony's side of things with that negative side is just like flip it instantly say something's like good or it's like yeah it's raining but it's like well it hailed yesterday so it's a pretty nice day or you know this is something I like to do in the rain or it's a great day for movies or just bring it into that aspect. And then it's like, it's not so bad sometimes. Yeah. Like it's it. not about like really like downgrading their complaint <laughs> so much as it is, as pointing out the half full side of their, of their complaint really. And, and that for me, and then with like family, uh, I have certain family members and I have actually said this uh, conversation. I'm not going to get into who it was or whatever, but it's like, I don't want to talk about, 
other people in a negative way. I don't want to gossip about my family. I don't want to judge their decisions. Let's just appreciate them for who they are. And, you know, we talked about this at the blast camp. Dave Hawes is awesome with this is just accept people for who they are, accept it. And if you don't like that energy, then no matter who they are, they need to be separated from your life. Another like analogy that I've used for people is and Danny and I really had to do this. And there was a question I saw that came in from Liz, but we not, we weren't using it today, but how separating, like it's very hard to separate friends from business and, and business from associates or whatever it is. But like one thing Danny and I did is at one point in our lives, we realized uh, we used our house as an example. So for me, family dinner growing up has always been a must. It was like something my family, my mom and dad enforced. And you know, we always sat around and had dinner and we try to do that, at least have a meal together every day in my house as it is. And so we say that, you know, basically anybody, as long as you're not a piece of shit (laughs) is allowed on my property, right? Everybody's welcome on my property in my yard, but only a certain amount of people This is obviously pre COVID, but only a certain, and it's an analogy. So only a certain amount of people are actually going to get invited into my house and even fewer are going to invite into my kitchen. So my kitchen or dining room is like very sacred for us. So the absolute closest people to me. And at some point in my life, I realized there's way too many people in my house and there was way too many people in my kitchen. So it was time to ask some people to leave the kitchen and get into the living room. Mm -hmm. And there was time to ask some people to get from the living room out onto the, into the yard. And we can hang on. That's kind of how I have to separate the relationships. And that's kind of how with the negativity. So those negative people, I really don't want them in my yard because those are the people who are going to mess up your party. The person that comes and is like, you know, grabbing the girl's ass, let the party drunk, being obnoxious. Like those are those people are telling the racist joke really like, you know, it's just like those people, we just don't want them in your life. And, you know, friends are not giving them the opportunity, have the hard conversation and say like, hey, listen, you know, Casey, I don't like your opinion on this. I don't agree with how you deal with this. And I don't want to hear you, you know, talk about people or whatever that is and give them the opportunity to kind of like say, okay, I understand. And I won't. It allows them to check themselves. And then if they are standing on their point, then it's not the friendship or not the relationship you need to be in, but it doesn't mean you have to completely burn that bridge, but it gives them the self-awareness that like, Oh, what I'm doing is incorrect or giving somebody else these negative vibes or, you know, I'm making someone else uncomfortable for something. So I think that's a big thing too, is, is being able to sometimes check people and just like call them out, not in a public setting, but call them out like, Hey, what you're doing right now is kind of messed up. Cause a lot of times it is just, some people don't un- realize that that's what they're doing or that's what they're used to. You know, that's how they're used to greeting people or that's how their friend groups always gets, you know, their conversation started is with a negative. And it's like, well, that's not how you have to do it. And then they're, it's an eye opener for them. And then if they want to make that, you know, change, then it might change. Well, isn't it crazy how somebody can walk into the, you know, into say you're having like a, a dinner party, you know, eight people over for dinner and somebody can walk in and, and before they even greet you say like, I'm not feeling well today. And how that can just bring the vibe of the whole room down instead of like, Hey, it's great to see you guys. Uh, you know what? I had a headache all day, but man, I, I, I'm just so happy I could be here to see you guys. I'm not sure how long I could stay. Mm-hmm. Like that is two that different sim- ways. It's Instead of like setting comment. the tone that like, yeah. hey, me and my husband or me and my wife are here today. We're here because we have to be here. I don't feel well and I want to get out of here as soon as I can. That's like the difference between those two messages. Otherwise, like, yeah. you know, I want to be here really badly. I'm not feeling great. So I'm going to stay, have as much fun as I can. And then I'm going to get out of here early to get some sleep. Yeah. Like that's just, like two different just ways. Just the way you can phrase something or like even put the thought into like, how, how can I present this without doing it? I don't, I some can't relate all the time with people who just want to express their negativity in the room. Cause it's just like, yeah, I can't always understand that why you need to tell everybody you're your things, but and if a member's really, really uh, negative here, we just send Nikki at them. Just send Nikki at them, <laughs> and she will cheer you up in like in like the next like two to three minutes. You will be smiling if you hang out with her. <laughs> so yeah, for sure, man. Like, I, I think we uh, kind of beat that one down, but it's it's a, a real thing, and I just hope people, you know, my my mission, the mission of the garage gym, my personal mission, to influence as many people in a positive way as I can. And if you have a mission like that, like. It's like from the minute you wake up, it's like, hey, Danny, good morning. And like, 
give the boys a kiss, tell them how, uh, how happy I am to see them this morning, even though I saw them before I went to bed, right? Go to the grocery store, try to cheer that person up just with like, hey, how are you doing? And like, I always laugh because everybody who walks by the front of the gym, you guys see me yell through the screen like, hey, how you doing? It has nothing to do with business. It has a little bit to do with police work because if people know who you are, they won't commit a crime against you most of all, right? So, but also it's like, but you see people are so like, they make eye contact with me and then I say, hey, how you doing today? And they don't know how to respond because they're just so used to people just kind of like shunning each other. They're sitting at that traffic light in front of our, you know, wide open garage door in the busiest corner of Amherstburg. And they must walk by there and see us all the time, but they're just so thrown off by like... It changes, it changes someone's like, it changes the room too, right? Or, and that person's idea right away. Like if someone comes in super negative and before they have the chance to throw that negativity out, you're like, hey, how are you? Great day today. They're like, oh, yeah, it is. I got <laughs> like in a car accident yesterday, yeah. but I'm okay. And then it just changes kind of the whole idea of things. Yeah. Um, so obviously there's a lot of new things that like lessons you've learned in the way that you are super positive, but like there's still things that bring you back every once in a while, but being in these better habits and stuff like that, it obviously didn't start like that or didn't always have these habits. Um, and so one question from Amy Esposito was obviously recently you've had so much success, um, which has inspired so many people while achieving that success. What is your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? Whew, that's a deep, deep rooted one. I'm going to fill up my glass here. This. I got some birthday tequila last week from Stephen Val. It was very appreciated. It's delicious. Do you need a refill? I'm good right now. Thank you. Yeah. So clearly, I was not always <laughs> such a positive person. Um, I I think I was always smiling. That's something I've always kind of been known for and making people laugh and have some fun. But like, I hit a lot of things behind anger. And I think a lot of young guys did that. And I think that's something that like why you're a little bit wise behind your beyond your years. But I'm not gonna compliment you any more than that but yeah like you know like you just especially young guys it's like we always have our chest puffed out and that's why kieran did so well here and you've done so well here because you've kind of like skipped that step in your life maybe or or you've outgrown it faster just hit it in and uh, the failures like man there's been a lot of failures um i failed in some relationships huge i've failed at leadership I know one of my biggest failures that i learned from i think we might even discussed it in our first episode was that well, that's why. Sorry, one second there. It's a counterbalancer. My mic keeps falling over. So one of the biggest failures I made on the tag team, and I talked about it actually in our, no, that's where I talked about it. It was in our meeting a few weeks ago, our big, uh, one of the big quarterly meetings that we had, was that I felt that I was not replaceable in the tag team. And I never want to make that mistake here. I want to build this business I want to build everything. I want to build your position here, Nikki's position here, Danny's position here, as if everybody on this team is replaceable. And it's not that I want to replace you. It's not that I don't care for you or Nikki or Steph or Danny or Riley or anybody else or any member here. It's just that every single person is replaceable. And you have to be of that opinion so that you can continue with the longevity. Because when I was on the tag team, I was like, man, I'm going to be the team. I was young. I was like loving it. I was excelling. I thought I was going to be there forever and I didn't spend any time trying to make somebody else into the next team leader. And realistically, I mean, I could have got shot. I could have broke my leg. And what happened though was nothing exciting like that. It was not that it would be exciting, but nothing crazy like that. It would be, it was just a new boss took over. I'm not a big fan of that man. Not many people were, but that new boss took over and said, Hey, it's time to leave. You're done. And I was like, Oh my God. So who's going to take my spot? And that brought a little bit of like, unease to the team on rest and at the end of the day being the leader that was my fault absolutely because anything could happen and it did i guess because mm -hmm. you know the chief did that and uh, i was out of there so we had to scramble and, and you know there was guys who stepped up and have done that job so great and we were just with that team last week and i said that in itself was to like see them progress through the ranks of that team and then do it better so that's here i'm trying never to make that mistake again and at home with my boys, as young as they are, I try to make them understand that too. It seems morbid, but I want to instill the same things in them so that they're prepared to take over, you know, the Smith family legacy. Or you know, as you when you when you get older and you have your kids, 
the right family legacy. And I think that's probably something your dad's instilled in you, whether you didn't know it or not. So for sure, my biggest failure was that. And I've definitely learned from it. Yeah, you definitely see it. I think you see it like I can relate a lot in sports too. You see the, you see the way sports works as a rookie. Then, you know, you have your sophomore, your seniors and your captains and things like that. And the best captains in those positions are guys who obviously are established in their spot and they're not, I think they don't have fear of a young up and comer coming and taking their spot essentially. So they know though, my five years is up in a year or two years. So they take the extra time to build up that rookie. Right. And I think that's exactly what you're going with. That is like, you never know what's going to happen in your situation and being able to express and teach your knowledge. I think a lot of people get caught up in, I know this information and I'm valuable because I have this information as opposed to get that information out there because as a whole, now you're going to be a lot more successful. Your group's going to be more successful. The people underneath you are going to be more successful because you have that knowledge for a reason and you're in that position for a reason. If you share that knowledge with me, doesn't mean I'm taking over the business or taking over the position. But now if something were to happen, you're not scrambling to now fill that spot. And as a lower tier of that, I actually understand a lot of the decisions that are being made and can justify them or start to learn more about it. So I think that's a huge thing is, is being able to being replaceable or that sounds kind of weird saying being replaceable, but it is not but, shying away from giving people the information that needs to be known. But realistic. And I like I have these conversations with my son and, and maybe people will think it's sexist, but it, it really isn't to me. I would like I'm a big believer in the father figure is the protector of the family. And is Danny more than capable? One thousand percent. One thousand percent. But my father kind of raised me in the same way. And my mother is you guys know her. She's a very strong person. But when my mother fell ill. It was those same lessons and my dad was working that my dad had instilled this like, hey, you're the man of the house. Your job is to take care of things when I'm not here. And I'm, you know, I'm the one and it wasn't doing manly things. It was cooking. It was cleaning the house. It was all these things. And I hope that my sons and I have these conversations, even though they're ridiculously young for this, that like, hey, your job is to protect your mother. And Danny doesn't need their protection. She will, she will do anything to protect them. It's just instilling this like values of them and giving them self-worth in the family and understanding that they have a role here. And if I'm not here, they need to step up. And whether you think it's too young at five and seven or not, I feel like it's that repeated lessons and not just yelling it at them, teaching them what that means. Like mm -hmm. open the door for your mother, help your mother with the groceries, make sure your mom doesn't and needs help here. And it, it's just building responsible young men and making sure that there's a succession plan in my own team, which is my family now. And as a leader position, would that not make your job easier? Like if you're yes. giving, if you're teaching me more and more about the business and now I'm able to do more without always asking questions, does that not make it easier for you as a business owner and allow you to go off into your Well, next yeah, let's talk about that from a business. It's, I mean, have, you've probably worked at other jobs, right? <laughs> like you guys know everything that's going on here. The part-timers know almost everything that's going on here. And the members know almost everything that's going on here. It's it's part of the plan. It's like an open forum here. Every country kind of understands the direction and they have their choice to be all in or get all out. And, you know, and also express that, like, I don't think that's the right choice. And I think that does make my job easier, my role easier, maybe harder sometimes the conversations I have to have or the front end work that has to be done like front end work for the back end rewards or whatever you want to say. And, you know, now it's allowing me to expand into this podcast, you know, run the blast camp, which is like, I think helped 15 guys really improve their lives. So it's, it's all towards that big plan. And I think it's kind of things we do without thinking about these days. But, you know, when you, questions like this, you kind of like realize like, Hey man, I really yeah. did. I really did fuck up back in this time. And I'm correcting that and making sure it doesn't happen again. So well, think about it too. Like I think back to this question just brings me back into forest fire. And the big thing with that is you're on four man crews and you see a lot of different, like my crew was fucking unbelievable. And my crew leader was Jamie Brisson and he was 
A lot of crew leaders, they have a specific set of jobs and then they pass it through to the crew boss and then your crew members are, you make it what they want basically. If you want for their first two years, they're just hose donkeys and they and they run hose and they do all that stuff. But he put in a lot of, not even a lot of time because we were very, very curious. TJ and I as crew members were very curious as to why we're doing what, right? Because we wanted to learn and we wanted to work our way up the ranks. And he did a great job as to, as long as it wasn't a need to do right this second idea or need to do right this second because we're getting burnt over is, what would you do here? And why would you do this? And then you'd, he'd take in your stuff, sometimes make the call off of that or say no because check the wind conditions and see what's happening. Um, that's something as a new person you wouldn't notice, but he's been doing it for 15 years, see how you know, this, this tree's burning off here or see what the ground's doing here. He just gave us that knowledge and he did that and it made our team so much better because now, one, I have more trust in him. I'm learning more from him. I know you know the information now and you have a reason behind it. You're not just saying, go spray that because I'm above you, go spray that. He would actually break it down. And so as a crew member, I have a lot more trust and respect for you because I know why you're doing something. You're taking the time to teach me this. And then as a whole unit now, the four of us are just running better and we're, I think, a lot more efficient because everyone knows why we're doing what. And if this is the reason we're doing this because we need to do this right now, we're going to move a lot better and we're going to be more efficient on the job. I mean, we just hired Colton Taylor. The kid's been here since he was 14 years old. He's now a scholarship baseball player throwing 90 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, somebody commented the other day is like, hey, nice. Colton's like back there slaving, putting together these benches, right? Like the, you know, the workout benches are our incline benches that we just bought. And you know what? We have spent so much time teaching Colton a lot of things, but there's still some rank that's got to be there. Some like, you know, a little bit of an adherence to how we're going to do things and how you're going to, and everybody's going to do the shit jobs, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's, that makes you for a better leader later and it makes you appreciate your job a little bit later. Like I say, Riley's jobs. working like the full-time hours and, yeah. and you know, my conversation was to Riley is like, Hey, you know what? We all worked, including me and Danny all worked the morning and night shift. And anybody who's been in the gym industry understands like working those splits. Cause there's nothing going on in almost every gym in the middle of the day. And, you know, event, and she's going to earn her way towards that nice, cozier schedule that you and Nikki now have earned. And that, you know, Danny and I work a little bit too. And, but we're all willing to do that. And it teaches you so that you don't completely come comfortable. And so, you know what? I think we kind of beat Liz's question in too. So I'm going to ask you this one. So um, we got the 30 day challenge going on. So we, we just, at 30 day challenge within the staff. So members don't get all fired up. We put you guys through one just a while ago. We got the 6 WT coming soon. But our coaches, man, we really needed to dial it in. And Danny and I, from a team building thing, we saw our coaches like we were getting a little bit stressed. And and you know, which in perspective, like reopening was like a great thing. We were all so excited, and then it was like holy crow, we were like bombarded with stuff and like you know different problems that we didn't foresee and different obstacles. So we kind of like came up with this coaches like thirty day challenge for the coaches, and at the end of it, there'll be a reward. If we all pass it as a team, we're going to, you know, go somewhere cool and do something cool. And um, so this question from Liz is kind of great timing. So for you, Casey, what do you think the hardest thing is or your biggest struggle for you to practice what you preach? Um, I think it's just doing exactly that. I think one thing when you when you say something and write it down is like be have that integrity to do it. And I think that happens a lot in the way of if you're marketing yourself as, you know, this athletic person or like in the gym, specifically in the gym industry, like right now is like you set yourself up and you're advertised as this athlete who can, you know, outwork everybody and do all this stuff. And I think that's always fuels me is just like if I'm presenting this kind of aura, then I need to actually do that. So when those days I feel lazy then I need to actually do it. But there's also struggles with that is like, there's things outside like eating or, you know, just different healthy habits sometimes that I can struggle with. But Brooke usually keeps me in check for, for a thing. But 
I think one is at least recognizing it. Like one, if you go off strand a little bit and start, you know, eat shitty that day is like, I'll kind of like punish myself by extra, extra work the next day or just always bringing myself back on that center line and just not allowing myself to fall off. Even when you're tired is like, all I have to do is start my workout. I think that's the big thing is like, all I have to do is change into shorts and start the workout with the class. And as soon as that first rep's done, whether it gets easier or harder the whole time, now I'm in it and I'm moving. So I think it's just like, when it comes to practicing what you preach, it's just like, before you have time to think of an excuse, just get into it and dive right into it. Yeah, for me, I'd, I'd have to say it's uh, scheduling. <laughs> like I, I tell everybody, schedule, 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 or a routine creates freedom. And I truly believe that. And I, I do think I'm pretty good at it and I have a pretty good system with it. But I know that the days or the weeks where I like kind of don't every night, what I do is every night before bed, I do like a brain dump and I schedule my next day, make sure sometimes it's just like making sure of what I've got to do. And it helps me go to sleep and I schedule it out. And I know that from seven to eight, I'm doing podcast notes, for example. And that when I do that and I, you know, I do like all those blocks throughout the day and including like time with Danny, time with the kids, work out with Casey, like all those things are scheduled. And once they're in there, they're in there for the most part, unless an emergency comes up. And I, when I say emergency, it's, I think people, other people make emergencies. I, I think that's a problem with people is they, they dictate things that are urgent when they're not, yes. but that's a whole other topic. But for me, when I don't do that, because it stops me from getting distracted. So if I was to make the podcast notes for this show tomorrow morning between seven and eight, my cell phone's away. That's it. That's the only thing I'm working on. When I don't do that, I'll get up and it's like, oh, what am I going to do now? It's seven o'clock. Just had my coffee. I've been up since five. I did this, this, and this. What am I going to do now? And then I kind of like, okay, I'm going to start making the podcast notes. And I start making the podcast notes and then I flip over and I start doing the Instagram posts. And it's like nothing gets done. Yeah. Being strict. Like I have your, no, being like, strict on your time. Missing that laser time. focus, right? And staying like completely on track. So I'm a big believer in that. If anybody's interested in that, like we really hammered that home with the coaching, uh, sorry, the blast camp, but also in my, my weekly coaching with the guys and I continue to try to get better at it. So if you, you're ever interested in something like that, please hit me up. Cause it's one of my re real, get yourself a good day planner. Yeah. Yeah. Danny bought everybody a day planner. Didn't she at one point one, at one point? And then I, I looked up some, I actually recommended to some of the guys on the blast camp. This isn't an advertisement thing, but it's like the action day day planner. And what it does, it has like, it has your week set up on one page and it has your like your tasks on the one side. So it, it just makes it easy for you instead of having to write through as ridiculous as it sounds, writing through the dates and the blocks and your own ideas. If you have this planner. This why planner. do you put in childlike writing every day, all your things on the whiteboard? I, every day I come in here, I know what you're doing. I don't have okay, to ask I'll you because you write. Oh, anyway, sorry. So to cut you planner, off. It yeah. has your like things to do. It has your daily time blocks from like except it starts at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. So I have to add to the top, but it has your hour to hour for each day. So I always put in like exactly my shift, what I'm going to do in those off hours of my shift and then anything else that comes up, then it has like a goal section. It has um, a delegation section. It just keeps me really on track. Um, but on your comment, so <laughs> when I'm teaching a class or I'm in the gym, obviously my day planner is in my bag, which is in our lockers in the back. So I'll be like halfway through a class and I can't leave and an <laughs> idea will come up or like an obligation I have that day. So I go and write in the corner my list. And so as the day continues, by the end of like probably the evening, there's probably seven childish writing things on the side as to like, oh yeah, add this, add the Zoom video to YouTube, add this. And then it's like ideas of like marketing strategies and all this stuff that I have just in blocks, one word things that no one will understand but me but it helps me uh, keep things. Writing it down, that was a big topic. Uh, where was I listening to it? Should have wrote it down, but that was the thing, <laughs> is writing things down when you come up with the, it was in our Business of Strength um, seminar this past week, our mastermind, and that was a big um, topic they're hammering home, is like, write down your ideas. Out of those ideas, there might be only five of the 50 you write down, but those are five ideas that you probably would have forgot an hour later, especially like I think at a gym, you get so caught up. 
not caught up because you're talking to clients, you're going through the classes and people bring up conversations and you might, and one conversation might spark a great idea. And then by the end of that class, you're not going to think of it or there's other things going on. So that's why in the gym or if you're in any other job situation, having a notepad or something is just like, go write that one or two word thing down on the board. That's going to spark that idea again. And then you can build off that. I think there's been a lot of ideas generated in the gym here off of halfway through a workout, Absolutely. even doing a workout halfway through a workout and being like, even for something that the customer said, yeah, yeah that's why we couldn't market this or that's why this program isn't working. And you go, if you write it on the board, now come back to it, might be a, the best idea you ever had. It might spark a whole new kind of money generator in the next. Yeah. Day. And so anybody who's confused with what Casey's saying and the garage gym and our gym owners is like, Casey is not like not to put anybody down not just a trainer right he's more than just and every full-time employee here full-time team member so riley steph nikki danny and i we all have the job as trainer but we all also carry us another hat we all wear two hats here we like to say some of us three or four at some points but it's two hats and you know your job is the internet <laughs> basically. <laughs> so all of our online programming and like, and, but you also know what Nikki's role is and, and which is like sales and memberships. And so you might have an idea that's going to spark Nikki. And, and that's where these things are so great to just write them down. And that's why it's so important. I think to have all of you guys on board doing different roles, not just getting on the floor and, and explaining exercises and making cues. It's like, cause you're all involved in this business. And I think that's huge. And let's, so let's take that time to spark Talk about another great team, which is Team Murray Insurance. Um, they're a sponsor of this one, and they are Murray Insurance and Financial Services in Kingsville, Ontario. They are Southwestern Ontario's number one ranked Desjardins insurance agency uh, by their clients, and they're also owned by Garage Gym Kingsville OGs, three-year OGs, Ian and Kara Murray. Ian and Kara as a team, they take pride in themselves on many of the high standards that the Garage Gym members have come to expect. Their expertise in the industry with a combined over 100 years of experience in their office. The best customer service in the industry, including claims concierge service, which is exclusive to their clients. They also focus on community, employing a local team members and investing back into the Essex County community on a continual basis. They are a one-stop shop for everything to protect you, your family, and your assets with the best policies in the industries. Oh, and they also have incredible rates, especially when you combine your home, auto, and other insurance policies together with them. Give their team a call or send them a text at 519-733-2331. 519-733-2331. Or you can check them out online at murrayinsurance.ca. I am on fire today. This is the new yeah, tequila wow. because I have not messed up a read-in <laughs> all day. Not yet. So let's not end not this yet. like... Uh, I got one more. What do you got? What is your shittiest job or what is the shittiest job you have ever done? Well, who is that going from? From Mr. Jeff McGee. From McGee. So McGee, one of our biggest fans. We couldn't leave him out. He sent in this question. It's awesome. So a shittiest job I've ever done. So don't I mean. Take it literal too. You don't have to tell the shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, shit. <laughs> yeah no. I have done some fucking shitty jobs, There's man. one person the who department. has the most sensitive nose. <laughs> oh, I have puked on so many calls because of crap. But, uh. Let me see what's my shittiest job. Oh, here's one that I puked for. So like I've worked some hard jobs. Let's talk about the shittiest task I've ever had to do. I guess I, I worked at a lumber yard. I was, that was a very hard job, which made me definitely appreciate my salary as a policeman and the job that I do right now. But my shittiest job. So there was a murder. There was a, was a murder that everybody's heard about. A uh, cabbie uh, basically was decapitated on, uh, in the West end. So, I'm a brand new guy in the TAC team at this point. And this was like a very high profile murder because of how violent and disgusting it was. And information came in that the guy had tossed a knife into a garbage bin somewhere in the downtown area. So what they did is, I don't know if they still did. So they called me and like the three other guys, the junior guys, oh, they called the TAC team. And then the team leader was like, hey, Speaking of uh, pecking order, like we talked about Colton Taylor, mm -hmm. pecking order that day, I was at the bottom. So me and the, the bottom four guys, they used to call us the Normans, so the Norman new guys. The Norman new guys, we think they're these cool SWAT guys on this day, but we were not. We went to the garbage dump, the city dump, and they have a thing. They have like a grid system that shows you whatever, like basically where the garbage was picked up, I guess, and where it is in the dump. Cool, right? I didn't know that. You wouldn't think they'd do that. So they come, 
with this huge dump truck. Mm. And it's imagine it's like a like a racquetball, an outdoor racquetball court with the three walls around it. Yeah. And they dump the dump truck of all the garbage from that neighborhood into this three walls. And my job and the other guys I was with, Adelmo Murph, KP, I remember this to the like <laughs> this is as clear as day, was to cut open garbage bags uh. looking for this knife. So we had to like put on these like white suits. No mask back in those days. Nobody cared. It was like 2003 or 2004 probably. And we had to cut through. And I remember it was like right near a couple of, uh, I think the carousels were going on. So there was like this abnormal amount of food garbage and it was summertime. And we were cutting it open and there was babies diapers and maggots. And I threw like, you know me, like a bad fart makes me puke. <laughs> <laughs> like literally like I couldn't change my kids diapers because I would be dry heaving the whole time and I puked that entire day cutting open garbage over and over finding and you know what we found fucking nothing of course all day long so that was for sure by far and none my shitty is job what were you man um, definitely maybe not as gross as that. One. <laughs> that was disgust. <laughs> I have so many disgusting things. Like we should do one disgusting thing maybe every week going forward. If people like that maybe. one, maybe we'll add that as our intro <laughs> segment each week. Um, one that stands out, we had, uh, we were on a fire. The whole job wasn't bad, but there was like one section of it. So we were on a fire. Um, and where we were camping was kind of in like this swampy area, like this marsh. And so you, the water to the, in front of our, in front of our nice tenting area was was definitely not the most beautiful lake you've ever seen. It was just like, I don't know if it was loon shit or Ugh. just mud, but like it maybe looked ankle or mid shin deep. But as soon as you'd step in there, you'd sink probably. For you city feet. folk, like it's like basically like quicksand mud is loon yeah. shit. And it stinks like hell. Seriously. So keep going. And so we were living in this, um, just in behind there. Uh, we had a fire. I think we were there for eight days, maybe. So the mosquitoes were insane. Um, but every morning, um, our logistics helicopter would come in. And the way it was set up, there was overgrown trees over the whole area. So in order for us to get the helicopter in, we'd cut a pad. So you chainsaw down a bunch of trees and you build up uh, with logs, this landing pad essentially for it. But because the section we were in, the helicopter would come in off the lake and it would only be able to come nose first into where our campsite was. So with that, the boom of the helicopter would be overhanging the water. So with, because of that, that's where they keep the gas, any extra, um, they always keep gas in there and every day you need new gas for your portable pumps. So the first few days I was lowest on the totem pole was my job was to go get the gas from the boom when the helicopter comes in. So it's like 8 a.m., you've been working a 16 hour shift the day before, your boots are wet, but they kind of dried over the night, so they're not bad. And your first job of the day is to go walk out to the boom, ankle or chin deep, and then start your day from there. So every day you're starting with every day. Wet, wet feet. So the first day I go out to do it, I walked out, and when I went to reach for the boom, I sunk down, like, up to my chest. So my knees from... I think it went maybe mid thigh was just loon shit and to the point where I couldn't even reach the boom. So I was like soaked now, chest down for the rest of the day. Luckily, Josh Bonner, our crew boss, well, I don't know if it was lucky or unlucky for him. He was a taller guy. So for the rest of the week, he had a spare set of boots that just for the morning he'd put on and walk out there, grab the gas and come in. But I just remember that being like just such a miserable day time to start your day is just like you but finally that hung everything on the trees and you're good and then you go start your morning with wet boots it was but that's why when we uh, talk about scheduling i always tell guys do your your biggest priority like 5 a.m in the morning yeah because like start your day with wet boots and the day can only get better right or like what's that saying it's, it's like True. You know, if you got to eat the frog, like eat the frog. First thing you do is eat the frog and the rest of your day is going to get better. I don't know where that came from, but that's like a saying that one of my coaches used to say and still says, but like, it's, it's true. Like, yeah. but are these like, are these really the shittiest jobs we ever did in our lives? Or are they the best? Because like they have They're great the stories yes. and they like shed you perspective on like when we're in here and you've worked like, you know, sometimes we have to work a 13 or 14 hour shift in here up on your feet and you're like, yeah, yeah. man, I just hung out with people and worked out They're all day. Dry. 
right? Like, yeah, yeah, no <laughs> big even deal. Those jobs, though, like the fun of that, like, again, just retelling it is like, yeah, I was soaked, I was muddy, my feet were wet, and again, one way to start your day, but it's like, okay, we're we're literally sleeping in a tent on this like unknown piece of land, no one's ever been in. Helicopters coming in in the morning to do that. You're flying in and out. Like it's just like, but that was also such an amazing experience, right? So it's like even when you're going through those shitty stories or shitty things happening, it's like there's so much surrounding it. Like you brought up like get through the shittiest part at the start because the day will only get better. One, I'll disagree with the wet boot thing. So if you keep your boots dry <laughs> for as long as you can through the day, I guess, do yeah. it. Because wet feet all day is the worst. The difference between the wet boots is like they're wet all day, I guess. But yeah. if you get through that shitty part or you get through that organization or whatever your biggest tasks are at the start of the day, then you've been, you at least have that accomplishment you're not worrying about all day. So I definitely agree with that idea for it, but I'm going to say no to the wet boots right at the start of the day. <laughs> all right. a spare pair. Eat the frog, but don't get your feet wet. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a word from the young, the young guy, the young, <laughs> the young wise Casey, right? Uh, on next week's episodes of shitty jobs, we'll talk about, uh, the first time I puked in a living room with a dead body in front of the family. So <laughs> remind me, hold me to that one. If you guys like the show, please subscribe, Comment, rate us, man. All that stuff helps. We love doing the show. And thank you guys all for your support. We we push towards like a quarter of a century of episodes, a quarter of a quarter way to 100. So cheers to that. Cheers. Talk to you guys soon. And that's it. We are 10-7 shift.